Hello, I'm Caroline Fairchild, and welcome to LinkedIn News Live, where the business conversation begins with you. What does it take to speak up against your employer? It's a question that is getting increasingly asked by tech workers who are morally against some of the actions their companies are taking. Just last week, Netflix employees went on strike after the streaming giant aired a comedy special that included transphobic statements. Our next guest blew the whistle at her tech company and now created a handbook for others to do the same. Joining me now is Ifoma Ozoma. She is the founder and principal at Earthseed, a consulting firm supporting tech accountability. Prior to founding Earthseed, she held policy roles at Pinterest, Facebook, and Google. She got her BA from Yale, where she studied political science. Ifoma Ozoma, welcome to LinkedIn News Live. Thank you so much for having me, Caroline. I've been, I've been looking forward to this conversation ever since I, what I read about this tech worker handbook, but I want to start with you and your career. You, you held a couple internships at Google before going there full time. What started you out on this tech path? Well, my interest in public policy and my interest in the inter intersection between privacy and technology and our traditional understanding of privacy rights is really why I decided to intern at Google and then uh, after or before graduating during my senior year, my decision was between going to law school and going to work full time at Google in DC. And I really wanted uh, to apply what I had learned practically. And so I decided to go into tech and have been uh, working as a tech employee and now as a tech worker outside of the industry since. And as I was a public policy major myself, I can only imagine how different it is to speak about these issues from an academic standpoint versus when you go into industry. What were some of the big learnings that you had once you left school and started actually practicing privacy, thinking about these public policy issues? That was exactly why I wanted to go straight to Google and to learn exactly how uh, companies are part of shaping the laws that we have now and the policy decisions that impact you and I and everyone else as uh, private citizens. It was such an amazing experience learning at Google um, how the company and how my team uh, impacted the work that we were doing in DC on policy issues and around the country with uh, members of Congress and with state level policymakers. And then when I moved to Facebook in California, a lot of the work that I did was international. And so I got to learn and see a lot of what the company was doing uh, to impact public, po public policy decisions outside of the United States as well. That really speaks to kind of this balance, if we even want to call it that, what we're seeing right now between private companies and then uh, actually our government deciding some of these things. From your point of view right now, who has more power? How much power do these private companies have right now in terms of setting these policies that we call public, but this private, these private institutions have a big role to play? Well, private institutions have always had a large role to play in public policy and in the decisions that our policymakers make. Uh, before it was large oil companies, uh, large steel companies, and now it's tech companies who have quite a lot of money and who are using that money to influence our policy decisions, uh, both in ways that we can see and in many ways that we can't. So you did a tour at Google, you did a tour at Facebook, and then you ended up at Pinterest. What drew you to that company? I was actually not looking at Pinterest and I was recruited there. Uh, and when I was recruited there, the way that the role was sold and the company was sold, because I was honest with them that I wasn't really a user of the platform, I had familiarity with it, but um, it, it definitely wasn't something that I had thought about before they reached out. Uh, the thing that they really sold me on was the ability to shape the company's policy decisions uh, from an early point. I joined as the second person on the public policy team there before the company went public. And so I got to play a huge role in the company doing things um, that were some of the first in the industry, honestly. Uh, we created a misinformation policy while I was there. I had a large role to play in the vaccine misinformation work that we did. And there was a lot that I was able to take part in while I was there that I was very proud of. Um, but unfortunately was taking place at the same time as uh, me having to battle the company on wage discrimination. 
Well, let's talk about that because before you spoke out against bias and, and dis discrimination at Pinterest, you, you were prepared. And, and I want to talk about that prep. But first, what inspired you to speak out? Tell us a little bit about that story. I mean, I had been someone my entire career who had uh, never been afraid to speak up internally. Uh, when I was at Facebook, I raised concerns about things that were taking place within the company. At Google, I did the same. And at Pinterest, uh, because of the way the company uh, purported to be a place that was open and that, uh, and that had leaders who wanted to do the right thing, I thought it would be welcomed. And so to be in a position where I had not found myself at Facebook or at Google, but I was at a company that claimed to be doing things better, uh, was really awful. And I was living sort of a double life where I would have interviews with reporters about the work I was doing that I was so proud of and still am. Uh, while going back and having to fight with the legal team about mm -hmm. something that I thought was just so straightforward. People should be paid fairly for the work that they're doing. And so when I was pushed out at the beginning of the pandemic, and then uh, a few months after being pushed out, saw Pinterest release a statement saying that the company cared about Black lives and Black employees and was going to do all of these things to show that they cared, I thought, the people who put together this statement are the people on the comms and legal team who just a few months ago were happy to push me out for just asking to be paid fairly. That's not right. There's certainly a discrepancy there. Fama, I love how you just say, I, I've always been someone who was able to speak out and not afraid to speak out as if it's nothing, because I feel like a lot of people are in companies right now where they may feel like there's wrongdoing going on, but they are fearful of, of speaking up. What were some of the things that you did to prepare for that moment so that you weren't afraid of what the what might happen after? Well, I was definitely still afraid um, because it's not a small thing to uh, break an agreement with a company uh, that is worth billions of dollars and could sue you. I mean, even if a case is eventually thrown out of court, uh, a lot of money is spent in the lead up and that's money that I just didn't have. And so I had a conversation, a very frank one with my attorney where he laid out all of the risks that I was going to be taking. And I said to him, this is something that I think is right. I'm acknowledging the risks and I am not eager to see them play out, but it's a decision that I've made and it's a decision that I'm moving forward with. And so what we did was um, just came out the smartest way to do it. So when I uh, wrote the tweets that I used to come forward initially, I had him review all of them just to make sure that I wasn't uh, inserting my opinion at any point, anything I was saying, I had documentation to prove uh, was true. And all of that ended up being really important because the reporters who I spoke to after uh, posting those tweets, wanted to see all of the documentation that I had. And uh, that ended up helping me out being organized and being prepared for that moment, because the company did try to claim that what I was saying wasn't true. So you lawyered up, my family of lawyers would be happy about that. They're probably listening into our conversation now. And you had these relationships with journalists, which I'm, I'm happy about as well. But a lot of tech workers, they don't do this before they speak up. And that's what your tech worker handbook that you've created is trying to do, create resources for other workers who may want to do what you did. Walk us through why you put this handbook together and what it provides. The handbook uh, came about and the idea for the handbook uh, as a result of the hundreds of people who reached out to me uh, in the days after I went public. And then in the months since, I've heard from probably thousands of people, both tech workers and people outside of the industry, who have wanted advice on everything from how to seek legal advice uh, to how to speak with reporters, how to establish the right terms on which to have a conversation with reporters. And I am so happy to answer people's DMs, uh, whether they reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, some get my number from friends of friends and text me uh, directly, and I will continue to respond to people. But it's not a scalable way to provide advice. And not everyone is going to feel comfortable 
reaching out to someone they don't know to ask for advice. And so I wanted to work with other partners, experts in the field, experts in uh, legal counsel, experts in working with the media, experts in security, and collect that information in a way that is freely accessible for people across the industry uh, and from the feedback that I've received since outside of the industry as well. What has been the feedback to date? Are, are you getting a lot of responses, people who are excited about using this resource? Uh, many, many, many. Uh, uh, the thing that's been most encouraging to me is hearing from uh, whistleblowers from the last decade who have tweeted and reached out to me personally to say that they are so grateful that this exists now and they wish that they had a resource like this when they spoke up. Uh, people like Ellen Powell and uh, Claire Stapleton and Meredith Whitaker and others have commented about the need for resources like this. Uh, and it's not, I say even on the handbook's homepage, it's not sexy work to create resources. It's not uh, glamorous to put together uh, a glossary or a bunch of information uh, that's helpful to people, but it is really the foundational piece that a lot of folks need because not everyone who ends up in a situation like the one I was in is going to have had uh, the policy or comms background that I did. Afoma, you're doing a lot of quote unquote unsexy work, but that's the important <laughs> work, I think. I see a question actually in the stream right now about the Silence No More Act, which you were central to getting passed in the state of California. Walk us through what it is and what it means and how you started working with legislators in California to get that passed. Yeah, so we worked with, uh, I was a co-sponsor team with the California Employment Lawyers Association and equal rights advocates. And we worked with uh, Senator Connie Leva, who is just a hero of mine, uh, to get this bill passed in California. And we're so grateful that the governor signed it a few weeks ago. So it'll go into effect January 1st. What the bill does is expand protections from a 2018 law, uh, the Stand Act, that was passed as part of Me Too and provided uh, protections for people speaking up after signing NDAs that had to do with gender-based discrimination, harassment, or assault. Uh, in my case, what I experienced was both gender and racial-based discrimination and retaliation uh, claims that I filed with the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing. And what we wanted to do with this bill, the Silence No More Act, is to make clear that public policy shouldn't have um, a hierarchy of identities. All identities should be protected equally. And so what the bill does is allow workers, no matter um, what their NDA or non not what their non-disclosure or non-disparagement agreements say, because those are the two NDAs, even though we often are referring to non-disclosure, when we say NDA, um, to speak out about any form of discrimination, harassment, or other unlawful conduct that they experience or witness while in the workplace. And so it's the furthest reaching um, non-disclosure and non-disparagement legislation that we know of around the world. Well, congratulations on getting that passed. But the reason that tech companies have been able to rely so heavily on NDAs for so long is that they say, we need these. We need these to keep our proprietary information safe. I read a New York Times op-ed that you wrote where you say that's actually not accurate. Break, break down for us why companies don't need NDAs for that. Yeah, so there's an appropriate use for non-disclosure agreements and confidentiality agreements, and that has to do with intellectual property, uh, protecting business secrets, uh, trade secrets. All of that makes sense. The bill doesn't touch any of that, and we wouldn't want to touch any of that. Where the use of non-disclosure agreements becomes inappropriate is when uh, companies use them to buy the silence of people who have been harmed via unlawful acts like discrimination, harassment, or assault. There's just no reason why in the United States with the uh, speech standards that we have and the value that we place on free speech, that if someone is telling the truth about an act that we already acknowledge and agree is unlawful, that they should be kept from telling that truth, particularly after leaving a company or even while they're there. And in addition to it just being wrong and it being out of line with the free speech standards we have in this country, it's a harm to shareholders and it's a harm 
to the business in general. When uh, individuals are silenced, it's often to protect an individual perpetrator or abuser. That should not represent the company. And I think for companies that truly understand that and value that and want to make sure that their shareholders are aware of what's going on and that they're holding individuals accountable for wrongdoing, they are taking steps to expand the protections from the bill beyond just their California-based workers. Um, and I'm really proud of companies like Expensify, whose CEO, David Barrett, uh, agreed to do it as part of a conversation like the one we're having right now. I know it's been fairly recently that this was passed, but I'm wondering if you've already seen the ripple effects and if those ripple effects are, are going to be made later down the road, what are you hoping that they are? Yeah, there are, uh, they've been on a number of fronts. I'm leading a project right now with uh, two organizations, Open Mic and Whistle Stop Capital, where we're engaging directly with companies and with the shareholders of companies uh, to ask them to expand the protections from the bill to all of their workers around the globe. Uh, a number uh, are in communication with us about it right now. One, Apple um, refused to do it. And so we filed a shareholder uh, resolution against them and we're working through that process with the, at the SEC right now. Um, but even beyond the private actions that companies and leaders can take, uh, we've seen other jurisdictions outside of the U.S. and within the U.S. take steps uh, to pass their own legislation or amend legislation so that it more closely follows the bill. So there are conversations happening in New York State where there is a bill with a loophole that we're trying to close right now in Canada, in Ireland, uh, in the U.K. and in other places, too. Public policy moving quickly. I, I don't know. Yeah. We have many examples of that here on LinkedIn News Live. Uh, Fama, we're, we're speaking right now. I'd be remiss not to say that we're speaking right now as, as Facebook whistleblower Francis Hagan continues to dominate the headlines. As an ex-Facebook employee, what's your take on what's happening there? Um, I think it's meta now, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That, that I needed. Those those emails dropped in my inbox as I was prepping for the show. So I'm glad that it's official. <laughs> yeah, no, same. Um, I am proud of whistleblowers anywhere. Uh, my definition, the definition that I use for whistleblowing is sharing information that's in the public interest. Regardless of what you think of the individual, the disclosures that have been shared about um about the harm to teens that Facebook was aware of, about uh, the harm via misinformation and disinformation and countries outside of the US is information that's important for us, important for policymakers here in our country and outside of our country as well. And so uh, my hope would be that Facebook moves past the defensiveness that we've seen uh, recently and towards a mode where they are ready uh, to take some of the criticism that uh, they are sure to get for a long period of time and to make the platform better for its users. And then also for the many, many employees within the company, many of whom I used to work with, uh, who only care about doing the right thing and want their company to do better. That seems to be a theme that we're seeing across tech companies right now. And although what's happening at Netflix right now doesn't meet your definition of whistleblowing, it is important in terms of employees speaking out. What do you see as the common thread between what's happening between those two companies and their employees saying, hey, I have an issue with this? You know, I do think that what we've heard from employees at uh, Netflix constitutes whistleblowing because we're hearing from folks who are uh, at a company that is engaging with them and even with consumers in a way that they don't believe is right. And it's information that many of us didn't know before. And so I think it's important that folks are standing up both for themselves and for their um, colleagues. Many of the people who joined that walkout that happened recently uh, probably do not identify as trans. And they are standing up and saying, that we care about our colleagues. Uh, we are actually putting into practice the values that the company claims that it holds. And that's what's important. Uh, I consider accountability an act of love. If you don't actually care about a place, if you don't care about an individual, you don't care to hold them accountable. And so what we're seeing is employees actually showing that they care about their workplace. 
If I'm, I have to bring in some of the members who are joining us in the stream. Maura says, standing up for what is right and just isn't the easiest thing. And I applaud Afoma Ozoma for giving her voice to do so. Ravina says, thank you. You are the voice of many. Personally, I'm thankful beyond words for initiating this. Katrina says, proud of you. This goes on every day and it's getting old. And Buki says, thank you, Afoma, for all that you've done and continue to do. So thank you for all of you who are joining us in the stream, Afoma, and thank you for, for joining us as well. I'm seeing a lot of people in the stream right now. So What's your advice for those who are maybe joining us right now and maybe at their desks, maybe thinking about speaking up about something, but maybe be afraid of the consequences? It's good to be afraid of the consequences and to weigh them. Um, I wrote at the beginning of this year about how uh, healthcare tied to employment is a huge tech accountability issue and an issue beyond our industry, of course. Uh, but particularly for tech, what it means is that many people can't afford to lose their health insurance and can't afford to lose their income and speak up. If I uh, had had dependence on my health insurance while I was at Pinterest, I probably never would have spoken up or even hired a lawyer because I knew that hiring a lawyer to defend myself probably meant the beginning of the end of my time at the company. Uh, since leaving Pinterest, I've paid $900 a month up until last month uh, to maintain access to my insurance. There are real costs to doing this. And I think as a society and as a community of broader tech workers and people who care about the industry, we need to provide supports for people who decide to speak up. But those who speak up should do so uh, as aware as one can possibly be of what the costs are, both to you and your family. When you become a public figure, your family becomes targets too, unfortunately. Mm. Portable benef benefits. That's just a whole other show that we'll have to do next time. Afoma, mm -hmm. I, I join the stream when I say thank you so much. Your story is so inspiring and we so appreciate you joining us on LinkedIn News Live. Thank you so much for having me. That was Afoma Ozoma, founder and principal at Earthseed and the founder of the Tech Workers Handbook. I want to thank her for joining us on the show. And thank you all of you for your comments. If you want to continue this conversation or check out others, go to the right of your LinkedIn feed. Or if you're in mobile, you can click into that search box. On Monday, I'll be back with you here at 3 Eastern for a conversation with former CEO of PepsiCo, Indra Nuyi, for about her recent memoir, My Life in Full. I'm Caroline Fairchild. Thank you so much for joining us on LinkedIn News Live.